Thank you so much for coming to our book sandwiching program today. I'm Dina Viviani, the programming manager, here just with a few housekeeping announcements to start. Um, first, to ensure your safety and the safety of everyone here, we ask that we maintain our edge aisles clear, and if you need to exit in an emergency, the nearest exit is the door cracked open to my right, your left. Um, for anyone using a hearing aid, we invite you to take advantage of our induction loop system. It amplifies all sound coming through the microphones. And if we have any time for Q&A at the end, please wait until this microphone is with you so that everyone can participate. Please silence or turn off your cell phones now so as not to disrupt the speaker. We ask that you use the microphone for all questions and comments, which I just said. Um, we'd like to thank the Friends of Bright Memorial Library for sponsoring this program. Please do pick up one of the um, brochures for our programs there at the table by the door. Uh, we have a Sunday Serenade String Trio concert coming up, along with some other interesting programs. Um, and we also have books that can be checked out for titles for future BSIs, and the BSI flyers are over there. And now to introduce our speaker. Oh, it's me. I'm introducing our speaker. All right. <laughs> um, Dr. Michael Mendoza is the ninth commissioner of public health for Monroe County and associate professor in the departments of family medicine, public health sciences, and nursing at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and Dentistry. Dr. Mendoza is a recognized educator and writer. He was named Teacher of the Year by the Illinois Academy of Family Physicians and has authored or co-authored numerous peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. His scholarly interests include studying and implementing practice-based innovations that promote quality and patient safety in underserved clinical settings and capacity development for the primary care and public health workforce. Originally from Chicago, Dr. Mendoza received his undergraduate and medical degrees from the University of Chicago. He received his master's degree in public health from, I messed something, oh no I didn't, from the University of Illinois Chicago, and he obtained his master's degree in business administration from the Simon Business School at the University of Rochester. In April 2020, he had the honor of having his face appear on a Donuts Delight Donut, and in his <laughs> spare time, Dr. Mendoza enjoys running, cycling, cooking, and photography. He lives in Brighton with his family and has been instrumental in helping our county navigate the COVID-19 pandemic. Please welcome Dr. Mendoza. Can you all hear me with this microphone? I think so. Okay. So uh, to, to clarify, I'm going to take my mask off because I'm more than six feet away from any of you. I've been boosted twice. Um, <laughs> not just once. Um, and I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, for making it through the last 18 months. Uh, by every measure, this has not been an easy time for any of us. Um, you know, I think, I think it's uh, tempting and common to recognize those who are in leadership roles, and I appreciate the recognition, but honestly, um, this is truly a testament to how, how well we have worked together as a community. As you've seen across the country, many strong leaders, and, and we'll talk about leadership in, in public health in a moment, um, but it takes more than a strong leader. It takes a community that's committed to science and evidence that is uh, adept at understanding, if not at least accepting, a level of uncertainty in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, the way this pandemic is shaping up both here in Western New York, across the country, across the globe, is largely a statement of who we are as a social fabric more than it is at this point an issue of public health and science. But we will talk about the public health, we'll talk about the science, but I think, um, you know, certainly from my vantage point, we're not just looking at the pandemic. There's certainly a lot of work to be done in the pandemic, but I'm also looking at the end of the road and where do we go from here? What does this pandemic teach us about civility and, and discourse around science and health in our community, in our world? And how do we move past the last two years? So um, that I'll go into in a little bit, but not to uh, take away from the book review, uh, Michael Lewis wrote the book, The Premonition. Uh, he is known for uh, challenging conventional wisdom. Uh, he was bold in writing this book in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, I will write a book someday. I have no desire to write it until this whole thing is over. Uh, I, I don't know how people can you're just setting yourself up to be wrong. Um, and I've been wrong enough about writing a book, so I'm going to write the book some other time. But Michael Lewis took a good stab at this, and he did a really good job. Um, this book chronicles the 
path of many public health officials across the country. The main character, this is a nonfiction book, the main character is Charity Dean, Dr. Charity Dean, who was the public health officer for uh, initially at Santa Barbara County in California, and then she moved into the California Department of Public Health. Um, her plight, honestly, is exactly like most of ours. Um, and I think this book does a nice job of underscoring what position we were in going into the pandemic, because that is largely the reason for where we are today. Could we have done this differently and better? Absolutely. Uh, when I write the book, it will be entitled, It Didn't Have to Be This Way, because it didn't have to be this way. Uh, and I think most of my counterparts across the state and across the country uh, will probably echo the same sentiment. So I have to get my trademark on that book now before somebody else takes it. Well, I keep announcing it. I'm really inviting somebody else to take my book title. Um, but the, the title of the premonition is ironic. I think it was intentionally ironic because, um, you know, premonitions suggest that you have some higher power that led you to some truth. And the point that uh, Mr. Lewis is making in this book is that we should have known all along that what was going to happen uh, in the last 18 months was going to happen no matter what. It wasn't a question of whether, it was a question of when. And he talks about public health, and I'll talk a little bit about public health before COVID. Uh, he talks about uh, Charity Dean, and I'll talk a little bit about her. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much on her story because her story and my story are very similar. Her story, my story, and the story of most public health officials is very similar. Um, and then we'll talk about the COVID response. And I'm really going to talk about the COVID response from the standpoint of Monroe County, uh, because that's most relevant to all of us here. But the book really focuses on California, uh, Northern California in particular, um, and sort of the whole federal response. And I'll get into some of that as well, because certainly the federal response will determine a lot of what happens at the state uh, and the local levels. But because a lot of this book focuses on the personalities, I'm just going to share a little bit, if you'll indulge me, about my background. Uh, because it, again, is like most public health officials. Most public health officials don't plan to be public health officials. I didn't plan to be a public health official until about a month before I took the job. Um, and most of us have a very diverse background. It, it, there's something about people who go into public health um, you know, you could call us lost souls at, at some level because public health is really a, conglom a conglomeration of a, a lot of different fields in science. And so my um, early days, uh, you know, had me in Downers Grove, Illinois, which is a suburb outside of Chicago, about 35 miles uh, west of Chicago. And my first job was in the chemistry lab. Chemistry lab, we, we were talking about heavy metals, and it wasn't the music at the time, it was heavy metals. Uh, and, and I was studying how metals that were extracted from nuclear energy sources could be disposed of responsibly. And this was in the 80s. And so the wave of environmentalism and climate action that we have today was nothing of the sort in the 80s. And so we were looking really just to take the, these radioactive heavy metals out of the ground and out of the potential of leaching into our water supply. And uh, so I had a very science-oriented background at first, but probably all of my scientific research experience had something to do with human health or the environment. And I didn't know it at the time, but that was really the root of my interest in public health. And I didn't even call it public health at the time because public health as a field uh, really was not very well defined. Uh, it's really not like it is today in the 80s. So my career in heavy metal took me to the University of Chicago uh, and I thought that I wanted to be a biomedical engineer because my father was an engineer and I liked biology and I thought, well, why not combine the two? Biological engineering, well, biomedical engineering, let's just, it felt like one of those uh, uh, threes company things where you have the two mouths talking at each other and eventually the word comes together. That's sort of how it came for me. Um, and I thought I was going to go to the University of Illinois, which is one of the top engineering schools in the country. Um, but because my mother worked at Argonne National Laboratory, which is the national lab affiliated with the University of Chicago, we were eligible for a full scholarship. I was eligible to apply for a full scholarship to the university. And so I applied because uh, my mom said, well, if you go to the University of Chicago, it will be cheaper than going to the University of Illinois. I said, I'm, I'm good for, you know, getting college on sale. So let's do that. 
I applied uh, to both the University of Illinois, got in, had a roommate, uh, and uh, had a room and the whole thing, and then I found out in April of my high school senior year that I got the scholarship to go to the University of Chicago, which, to be honest, you know, I knew it was a good school, but it wasn't my first choice because I wanted to be an engineer, but because it was, uh, it ended up being cheaper, and my uh, mother is a single mother, and you know, we were uh, strapped for resources, I said, well, I'll just go where it's cheaper. So I go to the University of Chicago, and I had my first meeting with my high school, uh, or sorry, my college counselor, my advisor, and he said, well, you know, Mike, what do you want to major in? I said, well, I want to be a biomedical engineer. And his response to me was, uh, Mike, we don't have an engineering program at the University of Chicago. <laughs> Imagine, I've already got my dorm room picked out, I have my comforter on my bed, and uh, my advisor, uh, just uh, underscored how I had not done any research about my degree <laughs> at this world-renowned institution. So I took biology, because that was half of the biomedical engineering work, and I was a biological sciences major for two years, and I found out that it really just wasn't me. A lot of science, a lot of research, but it didn't have that connection to the human part, the community part. And even you know, in the early 1990s, I knew that that was going to be a priority for me. So I ran into an advisor, Dr. Ted Steck, who's still there now. He is a biochemist, but he had a strong interest in uh, research about uh, environmental health. And he said, well, Mike, you ought to go to medical school, because back in the 1990s, you really couldn't get very far in public health if you didn't have a medical degree. So I said, okay, I'll go to medical school. Um, and I went to medical school, and I found that I didn't really love that either. Um, he steered me toward a degree in environmental studies, because that's what I decided I could finish before my scholarship ran out, um, not being a bio major because I'd done all the biological stuff before that. So I took my environmental studies degree to the University of Chicago for medical school and uh, was very interested in cancer research. How do you prevent cancer? How do you look at pollution in a different way to prevent cancer in uh, the air and in water? I did a lot of extracurricular activities in medical school, in fact, I think I spent more time outside of the class in medical school than I did in class. Uh, volunteering in the community, uh, working in homeless shelters. Uh, you know, we helped to set up a, a, a free clinic for pediatric patients on the south side of Chicago. Spent most of my time outside of um, you know, the classroom. Got involved at a national level at the American Medical Student Association. I was a national officer for that for some years. Uh, had the experience of working on Capitol Hill, understanding what lobbying looked like. And that's how my policy uh, hat was born. Uh, I went on to serve in the National Health Service Corps, which is a federal program that uh, has uh, you get free tuition to medical school. So I got medical school on sale as well. And uh, in exchange, I worked on the south side of Chicago for four years in an underserved setting, which uh, was probably one of my most uh, uh, important experiences in terms of my medical career, uh, because that was really the last time I was a, a real doctor seeing patients every day, five days a week, and, and one weekend a, a month. Uh, I saw more patients in those four years than I did in my entire training until that point. And so then I joined the faculty at the University of Chicago uh, in that federally qualified health center south side of Chicago. Uh, and I got involved in a project called the Urban Health Initiative. Uh, the Urban Health Initiative uh, had as my boss, Michelle Obama, and I got to work with Michelle for three years uh, in the University of Chicago, and I'll never forget on the Friday before her husband announced uh, his candidacy for president, uh, she and I were in her office, which was, you couldn't socially distance in this office, let's put it that way. Uh, she was the vice president for medical affairs at the University of Chicago, a very humble, small office, uh, you know, desk, her chair, behind her was a credenza of her kids and Barack, which was pretty awesome just to look at that. Uh, and I come in and she takes her shoes off, she puts her feet up on the chair, and we were just talking. And, and this was the last meeting, this was the last time I'd, I'd seen her face to face. And, and I will never forget how humble she, she is. Very articulate, very piercing in her gaze. I met her for, we'd had many interactions throughout college. She was actually my faculty advisor for the, the community service uh, uh, fraternity that we started. But this was the last time I had met her in person, and she said, Mike, uh, my life is really going to change next Monday. And that was the Monday that Barack announced his candidacy. So I hadn't seen Michelle since then, but I had the opportunity to work with her and, and to learn about how do we connect academia to public health. And that was really what nailed it for me, working in that experience. 
was what was what really brought home the need for me to want to do something beyond clinical medicine, not to, you know, diminish the importance of clinical medicine, absolutely important. But for me, I wanted to do something beyond clinical medicine. So uh, I brought uh, myself and my family here to Rochester now 12 years ago uh, because my wife is a geriatrician. She worked at the Jewish Home of Rochester for some years. Now she works at the university. And uh, she got recruited to Rochester to work with Dr. Tim Quill, who's a palliative care specialist, who some of you may know. And uh, I was jobless, so I followed and uh, landed myself as the medical director of Highland Family Medicine, uh, where I stayed for seven or eight years. Uh, realized that uh, I didn't know anything about how to run a medical practice, so I went to business school at Simon for two years. Learned a lot more there, did some work with the health information technology part, the, the uh, electronic medical record, and that's where I trace my frustrations with public health informatics today. And when we talk about our response in the community, a lot of it had to do with our inability to talk to one another and communicate about information, both at the local level and the regional and federal level, uh, certainly. And then I was really studying team-based care, you know, and, and I won't give this whole talk now, but, but in primary care, um, you know, we can't do good medicine unless we have a team. You know, your doctor is busy doing things that only doctors should do, ideally, and he or she is not enough to help you with your medical care. We need a team. And I've taken that principle to, to public health and the health department, and I show you in a couple of slides, you know, we could not have done what we've done in the health department were it not for the team. Unlike in medicine, where as you climb the ladder, if you're a doctor, you climb the ladder to a higher rung and you supervise some doctors, and you go up even higher, you supervise more doctors. In public health, when you climb the ladder, you supervise more and more people who know more than you. Okay. And that's a good thing, because I supervise only two doctors, three doctors, in the health department and I supervise uh, over 260 people in general. And during the height of the pandemic, our department grew to almost 2,400 people. Um, and, and the vast majority of them are not physicians. And so um, it takes a, a lot of humility, and in, in, in my opinion, common sense, when an engineer or an accountant tells you what to do, you listen. Because I don't know the first thing about engineering or accounting. Um, and so that is sort of the philosophy that I took to this role in the health department. I've been in this role now for, it feels like, decades. <laughs> uh, I started the job in 2016. You may remember I was temporary. I was the interim commissioner of public health. I got there in April of 2016 after uh, it was literally a revolving door of health commissioners in the health department. And uh, I met with all of my, uh, you know, my team. And I said, you know, tell me, you know, what has been your approach in, in conducting this di division within the health department in the last three or four years, which was how long it had been since Dr. Doniger was the health commissioner, who many of you may know. Uh, Andy Doniger was in the role for some decades, 20-something years. And everybody said, without hesitation, my job is to keep the boat afloat. Every direct report, every manager in the health depart department said the same thing. I want to keep the boat afloat. I thought to myself, well, that's mediocre. <laughs> we ought to be able to do better than just keep the, the boat floating. And that was when I decided I needed to take the job as a permanent commissioner. I said, we, we cannot have as our county health department a team whose role is just to keep the darn thing from sinking. And I said, we need more. And I am the lucky or unlucky son of a gun in the chair right now and try to take a swing at this and see if we can make the health department something great again. And so I took the role. Uh, many of you, uh, this is actually important uh, for the book. Um, in the state of New York, there are seven commissioners of health for the seven largest counties. I think it's counties greater than 400,000 people have to have by a public health law a physician as their commissioner. Uh, there are other physicians who head health departments in the state, but they don't have to be physicians. In all of the smaller counties, you have to have uh, a health degree of some kind and some additional training in public health. So um, I was appointed by then County Executive Cheryl Donolfo, who uh, is a Republican. And I was confirmed by the county legislature, which uh, is and was Republican. And then I was also confirmed by the state legislature, which at the time was Democrat, um, to a six-year term. 
And so I think I'm in year five of my six year term. I think I go up for reappointment next year. Just <laughs> part about that one. Uh, but um, it's, it's been that way because in general, the county health commissioner is meant to be apolitical, to be nonpartisan. And I have my own personal leanings that I do my best to keep separate from my work as the county health commissioner. I think if we've enjoyed any level of success in this county, it's because I have tried to stay out of politics. Which doesn't mean people don't try to bring me into politics, and there's a whole lot of that going on. But I try to promote the science, the evidence, and I'm very comfortable saying, I don't know. This is what we need to learn in order to answer that question. There is too much uncertainty in this pandemic for anybody to say, I have all the answers. Anybody who says that is not having all the answers. So throughout this time, I maintain my clinical practice at Highland, uh, seeing my patients who I really enjoy seeing. I just came from clinic this morning, and it's what keeps me grounded. When things were going nuts at the health department, I would go to my clinic and see patients for fun. Because that's honestly what kept me sane in March of last year. And this is the health department. 260 people strong on a good day, a normal day. Uh, we're probably numbering in 500s right now. Uh, you know, our footprint is expanding in the community. We have a, a large number of uh, vaccine clinics that are about to launch this Saturday in response to the pediatric dose, which we anticipate uh, being greenlit uh, tomorrow, or if not tonight. Um, and uh, again, what I'll say here is that this is who you need to thank. Not me. This is who you need to thank. Uh, these are the unsung heroes of the health department. They don't generally uh, make the news, and that's how they want it. Our, and that's how I would rather be. I'd rather not be on the news every day if I could avoid it too. But it's an important part of my job, so I get it. But uh, a good day in the health department is a day that nobody knows about us. Because you all don't want to think about cooties in your restaurant food. You all don't want to think about what's cursing through our water. If we can keep that stuff clean and healthy, everybody can live their lives worrying about other things. But when we do our job well, we like to think that nobody has to think about us. And, and that's what goes into public health. You don't get people in public health who want to be at the limelight, who want to be you know, uh, you know, celebrities and whatnot. You get people in public health who just want to do the good work, stay behind the scenes, and go home. And that's who I have on my team, and it's a really wonderful team. So. I will get back to the book, but I do want you to understand some things about public health. Um, these were the top 10 public health achievements of the 20th century, the 1900s. Top 10. Taken together, all of these interventions, if you will, are responsible for an uh, improvement in life expectancy of 25 years. When you look at 1900 to the year 2000, life expectancy in the United States increased by 25 years. So, on average, on the day a person is born, in 2000, they were expected to live 25 years longer than an individual who was born in 1900, okay? There is no chemotherapy, there is no blood pressure medicine, not even aspirin can claim to have that level of life expectancy improvement, okay? Public health prevention is what extends longevity in general, okay? When we talk about the ills of our our public health now, premature death, COVID being one, the opioid crisis being the other. Okay, we've had a four-year decline in life expectancy in the last five years because people are dying in their 30s and 40s. People who pass in their 80s and 90s don't reduce life expectancy in general because they lived 80 or 90s, 90 years old. But when an individual dies prematurely from car accidents or from any kind of accident or from an infectious disease that's preventable in their 30s and 40s, that person loses 50 years of life, essentially. And that's what causes, the last time life expectancy went down before the opioid crisis was HIV and AIDS. And many of you remember that, younger people dying from AIDS and HIV. The other thing that reduces life expectancy is war. Younger individuals who pass away. So in World War II, we had two consecutive years of decline in life expectancy, and the time before that was World War I. We had three consecutive years of life expectancy. We are now looking at four consecutive years of reduction in life expectancy, and we're ostensibly not at war with anybody except ourselves. I also point this out because 
None of these things is a guarantee. If you look at what's on this list, um, many of these things are under fire right now, regardless of who's in the White House, regardless of who's in the mansion in Albany. Um, communities like ours in Monroe County, even in Brighton, don't agree necessarily about all of the things on this list. And uh, you know, it's not sexy and glamorous, but this is the stuff that helps us to stay healthy. This is the stuff that helps us to keep healthcare costs down. Only 5% of the healthcare dollar in the United States is devoted to prevention. 95% is devoted to diagnosis and treating conditions that are already out of the barn. And we could do better than that. Again, it didn't have to be this way. But public health isn't perfect. And uh, you all have seen the limitations of public health over the last uh, 20 months. You know, there are a lot of things in public health that we wish we could do better. And there are a lot of things about public health that is just designed the way it is. So public health is the health of communities. So in contrast to what I do in my clinic where I see patients and families one-on-one, -on -one, as a doctor in public health, my patient, if you will, is the entire county of Monroe. And so I have 742,000 patients under my watch as the Commissioner of Public Health. And I can't meet with every single person, obviously. Um, and so I, my role is to design, develop, support programs that promote prevention and, and decrease disease in our county. Uh, the data, you know, I know that a, a lot of people don't think about data and informatics when they think about healthcare and medicine, but it is by far the most important language that we have to speak in health. And early in the pandemic, we were not able to tell the community what was the mix uh, by gender for the early cases. So we had male and female, but gender can be expanded to non-binary genders. We didn't have anything recorded about non-binary genders until about six months into the pandemic. We didn't have race ethnicity data. We couldn't actually demonstrate what we now know, which is that health disparities exist across the board. We didn't have the data to support our hypothesis for the first three months of the pandemic because we didn't have data. The data that we have at the health department is old. Okay, we get survey data, we get data downloaded from the state, but the people who have the up-to-date data are in medicine. They're your doctors and your healthcare providers. They have a lot of data. None of that data goes to the health department, which most people are surprised by, because there's privacy laws. Uh, there's all sorts of privacy laws, and in general, as the county health commissioner, I don't have access to your record unless there is a public health reason for it. When there's a public health reason, I have full access to your record, and you don't have to give my office permission for that. It's written into law that if there is a public health epidemic, the county health commissioner has full access to your records, and that's how you want it, because you don't want me getting 742,000 consents when we've got to respond to a pandemic in 15 minutes. Okay, so that's written into law across the country. Um, we have workforce shortages in public health. Everybody has a workforce shortage nowadays. Funding is uncertain. And the real problem with public health um, is that most health departments, and, and public health is more than health departments, it's a lot of things, but in health departments, uh, most of us are designed, are structured around the health needs of 1950. So when you look at my workforce in the health department, the vast majority of people are in that uh, environmental health area right now, sanitation, because in 1950, we didn't really have antibiotics. We didn't have an appreciation for cancer and heart disease and diabetes and high blood pressure like we do now. We were worried about infectious disease and sanitation. And so when health departments were born in 1950s, everybody said, well, we need to have a sanitarian leading the health department, so people who did inspections, people who looked to make sure the water and the air and restaurants were clean and safe. But right now, when you look at what causes most uh, premature and total mortality, it's chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes. Those are the things that we actually need to do a better job at preventing. We do a really good job treating it. But by the time you have advanced heart failure and your life expectancy is six months, there's not very much that anybody can do. But we can prevent a lot of heart failure by improving access to healthy air and water, by ensuring that our diets are healthier and heart friendly. But by the time you have heart failure, there's not much you can do. So we need to do a better job in preventing chronic disease. But unfortunately, and this is a point that the book makes very, very poignantly, 
funding in public health is uh, what I would call opportunistic. So the last time we had any major increase in funding was 9-11. A lot of interest in funding public health because bioterrorism, for some reason, found its way into the public health. That is the bucket that the government at the time, George W. Bush, decided to put bioterrorism. And then he created the Department of Homeland Security, which was sort of a quasi-law enforcement uh, uh, entity. But bioterrorism was, was, was put into public health. And so in the wake of 9-11, we saw all sorts of increases in funding and resources. Even to this day, uh, those of you who have been to the post office on Jefferson Road, uh, there is a machine in, that, uh, in the back that literally sniffs every piece of flat mail going through, and that's I think 70% of all the mail going through this county, gets sniffed for anthrax. And they spent a lot of money in keeping this thing afloat. Uh, and we haven't had anthrax in a good 25 years. But that was a remnant, and taking it down, you know, once you start something, taking it away is really, really hard. Try giving your kid a PlayStation. Once you give them a PlayStation, cat's out of the bag, you're never getting that back. Um, we had an anthrax machine installed in 2004, I think it was here, and it is still functioning because nobody can figure out why or how to take it away. Okay? That's right now. So all sorts of examples of increases in funding. But this is what happened to funding from 2010 to 2014. The good years. Quiet years. Not much going on in public health. We had just had uh, H1N1. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, President Obama uh, declined in developing a federal pandemic preparation plan in response to H1N1. And he had a lot of good scientists giving him advice. But he was weighing the cost and benefit at the time, and I'm not familiar with all of the calculations there. But uh, most people don't realize that it was President Obama who uh, declined on having a federal pandemic preparation plan. Now, what role could that have had in the COVID pandemic response? Nobody really knows. Because as we'll talk about, the federal response in COVID was very unclear. Okay, so having a pandemic plan is only good if you follow it. And it's unclear if the administration in 2020 would have followed the plan anyway. But most people don't realize that we had a chance to have a federal pandemic preparation plan in 2009 and passed on it. But this is what happened to funding in public health from 2010 to 2014. The alphabet soup, there are various eight federal agencies that uh, fund public health. Uh, the FDA and the Indian Health Service are the only two that saw an increase in funding. And this, again, was during the Obama years. Very favorable years from the standpoint of public health funding. And we saw a 14, I think, or 12% decrease in total funding to public health during the good years. So we actually need a health system. And this is sort of the only slide I'm going to put in here that's totally unrelated to this book. But this is what I work for in the health department. Okay, when I look at my role in the health department, it's bridging all of the parts of our system in our community, whether it's acute care, nursing home, long-term care, health departments, public health agencies, nonprofits, community-based organizations. We want to find a way to connect all of that. And I believe that we have to not just shake hands and enjoy you know, hors d'oeuvres together. We actually need to share information and data. Schools, by the way, libraries. We need to share data because that's how we do a better job, not wasting money and time for the public. But we need all of this. Um, and uh, you know, we have some, a lot of it, uh, but I think we can still do more. So, halfway through. Um, gosh, where, where does this start? January, January 2020. Um, I was watching the news just like all of you. We were actually quarantining uh, faculty and students who were coming in from China from their winter break. And we were actually already quarantining students at the University of Rochester in January. Um, and it's a local health department responsibility to do isolation and quarantine. So if any of you have been under quarantine or have had COVID uh, and been isolated, you got a, an order from me uh, to isolate or quarantine as, as needed. Um, but this was new for all of us, and we were uh, caught by surprise to some degree. Um, but ironically, or coincidentally, in December of 2019, 
we had practiced our pandemic influenza plan. So here in Monroe County, we've had a pandemic influenza plan uh, in place since probably 2007 under Dr. Doniger. The pandemic influenza plan is essentially the plan that we followed for COVID, except there were two major differences. In pandemic influenza, it was based on a vaccine and antiviral treatment. Okay, that was, those were the two big parts of the pandemic flu plan that obviously we didn't have at the beginning of COVID. But all of the isolation and quarantine procedures, all of the communications procedures, all of the, the, the behind the scenes that we had to, to go through in the health department, we had actually practiced all of that uh, in December of, of 19. And by practice, we have what we call a tabletop drill. We literally bring everybody together as though it was a real thing. We have people simulating, okay, we have a case of whatever coming in from wherever, go. And we did this for two days, and we didn't know what was coming in December, for sure, nobody really knew. Um, and so I think we were as prepared as we could have been. Were we entirely prepared? Absolutely not. Nobody was. Nobody was entirely prepared. Um, I remember the day that we uh, convened our, our Public Health Emergency Operations Center, January 24th. Uh, and I thought it was uh, kind of cute, let's go buy, get some Corona beer and wine. Um, and we, we were just kind of like that. It's coronavirus. We have a lot of coronaviruses, we're used to this. Little did we know. We opened up our, our operations center that day, um, and the news was all over this. And uh, uh, we had done all the preparations that we could. Uh, we had a lot of uh, plans in place, but nobody ever actually had to pull the, the trigger on the pandemic flu plan, because we hadn't had pandemic flu since 2009. But we practiced it every year. It's the, it's the plan that we probably, well now we've dealt with hindsight, it's the most important plan, but I, I kind of thought that was the most important plan. We practice a whole lot of plans that have to do with things blowing up and missiles landing on the airports and things like that, and, and those could happen, but they're really probably unlikely. Uh, but pandemic infections are actually quite common. And I'll never forget on March 12th, Thursday, March 12th, I gave a whole bunch of talks that day. I gave a talk for the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce, I gave a talk there in the middle for uh, United Way. Uh, room was packed. No masks, no social distancing. We didn't talk about any of that. Um, I remember on that day, you know, I was talking about this hypothetical possibility that we might have to close a business or two, or maybe even the schools. That was on Thursday, March 12th. All hypothetical. And somebody even asked me, well, how likely do you think that would be? And if we do end up closing the schools, when do you think that would be? I said, well, We've never closed the schools in this community in recent past. Last time schools were closed was during the uh, flu pandemic of 1918 and 19. Probably a couple months if we ever have to close the schools. So I'm thinking of maybe April, May, worst case scenario. Little did I know, uh, the first case of COVID uh, literally rolled in uh, from New York City, a gentleman whose name I still remember. Um, he uh, traveled to Italy, uh, was posting pictures of his escapades in Italy, and they're not unusual escapades, a person going on vacation like anybody else would. And he uh, landed at JFK, uh, took a cab to the Greyhound bus station, got on the bus, and went across the state. And then he got to Rochester, got off. Uh, there were some differences in the story that we heard, so we did our first contact tracing with him. We got a different story than the one he went to the media with, which was kind of annoying. Uh, we tried to, so we literally got and subpoenaed the, the video footage from that Greyhound bus arriving at the station. We followed everybody off the bus. We identified all of them. We went back to JFK. Now, it's not our jurisdiction, but JFK actually went and uh, tried to identify where he was coming off the plane at JFK because at that time, we were going to try to isolate anybody who was within 12 feet at the time of him throughout his, and we didn't have the rules about six feet and 15 minutes like we do now. So we were literally doing the best we could trying to find anybody who was in contact with the gentleman. Because we didn't know how contagious this was. We didn't, have, we didn't even know, we didn't have a name for it even at the time. So long story short, um, he ended up going to Highland Hospital, got treated and released. By the time he was at Highland, 
we knew at Highland, which is where I practice, that this is not a normal virus. So the entire team at the ER at Highland was full on Tyvek. We're not doing that now either, thankfully. But they had the whole nine yards laid out for them at uh, Highland. So that was our first case in Monroe County. Um, it wasn't our first case of local transmission. So when you have a local transmission, that's when things really get started, okay? That was an imported case because that person came from literally outside of our jurisdiction. The first case that we had was on uh, later that day, I think it was the 13th, 12th, late in the night. Um, and it was a school worker in the Greece Public Schools. I remember her name very vividly as well because I talked to her, I talked to her family, I talked to her family's family. Um, and it was somewhat lucky that our first local case was a school professional. Had it been anybody else, I don't think we would have closed our schools the following Monday. But because it was somebody who worked in a cafeteria line at a public school, knowing what we knew at the time, I think we ended up, luckily or not, making the right call to close all the schools that following Monday. When we closed the schools, uh, we had a press conference, I think it's the next page, uh, not yet. We had a press conference with all the school leadership, law enforcement, all the town and village, village supervisors and mayors, um, and uh, the leadership at BOCES to, to make this unprecedented recommendation to the schools that they closed fully, shut the doors. Teachers had no preparation, students, families, no preparation, okay? Um, and we were literally making it up as we went along. Nobody had a Zoom remote option in their curriculum. Zoom was barely even a thing in March of 2020. Uh, it was chaotic, absolutely chaotic. Um, and that's when things started going off. So um, these were all the hypothetical things that I talked about that day, or the day before, things that we might entertain in a month or two that ended up being all true. Dividing classes into smaller groups, we skipped that stage, we just closed them all. Remote instruction, Having distance learning, I thought that'd be a good idea, but none of us had it. Um, you know, people who had flexibility in their travel abroad, well, nobody was traveling then. Workplaces, remote options, if you can do meetings by remote, that would be perhaps ideal. Modifying or postponing mass gatherings. Nobody would have it at the time, and for me to suggest that was uh, something short of uh, crazy. Concerts, festivals, okay? Things that we have to think about in making these decisions. Local prevalence, we didn't know. If you'll recall, we were barely even testing. Okay, so a lot of people who had COVID in March of 2020 don't actually have proof of it. Antibody levels don't currently show very much uh, with regard to prior infection. We didn't know anything about the properties of the virus at the time. We didn't know necessarily about person-to-person -person contact. We were wearing gloves. We were worried that touching objects was gonna give you COVID. Now we know that that's very rare, if not impossible. Um, you know, traveling, you know, most of our initial response was in curbing travel. Too late. It was already here. I think by the time we detected our first case in Monroe County, it probably had been here for two or three weeks at least. In the community, not in quarantine like at, at the U of R. <clears throat> School closures, we talked about that. These are all the things that I shared with the school superintendents that day, and they thought I was nuts. And I probably was. But I was right. Okay, this all had to happen. And so all of these interventions you're supposed to consider, and you're supposed to have a lead up to all of them. So that pre-pandemic phase, that little flat period of tranquility, that was about three days here in Monroe County. Okay, we didn't have the luxury of tranquility. We had to launch into pandemic mode within a weekend. And that was incredibly stressful for everybody involved. So this is taken from the CDC. This is the CDC's pandemic preparation plan, the federal plan that we didn't develop more fully in 2009. It was good, it wasn't great. Uh, we could have had more uh, to guide us at a local level, but it is what it is, it's what we had. And by the way, we're still in this. You know, we're, you know, deceleration, it's like a stop and go car. We've accelerated and decelerated, and accelerated and decelerated, okay? I, I think we're gonna accelerate again. Our number today is 337. 
so it's not going away. State of emergency. So from a political standpoint, and the book gets into this, um, there are really very limited powers that I have, and, and that's a good thing. Okay, You don't want people to have unlimited powers uh, in general. But when there's a state of emergency, you declare a state of emergency to allow officials to circumvent the law temporarily because it's in an emergency. Okay, you don't want to have to go to the legislature to seek approval, which could take days in a good circumstance, months normally. You don't want to have to go to a, a legislative body to get approval to act in an emergency. Right? When 9-11 hit, the president had free reign to do whatever he could because it was a state of emergency. Okay, so we passed a state of emergency here in New York State, which allowed the governor to uh, implement laws that did not have to go through the legislature, and obviously that took a lot of criticism. We did the same thing here in the county, which allowed us to uh, suspend or modify existing ordinances that would then allow us to require masks, to require social distancing, all the things that we talked about then. We couldn't do that were it not for having a state of emergency. So I like this slide here taken from TV. Uh, eight cases in Monroe County. And we were we were scared. That was eight. Total of ten to date. We were following every single person at the time. And we, we had in the health department, we have our little operations room. For probably about two months we had you know butcher box block paper, the names of every individual on the wall. And we were trying to literally draw lines. So, you know, case twenty-four was in contact with case eighty-three at Wegmans on March sixteenth. And we literally were drawing lines, and that's how you do contact tracing. And you know, by the time cases got to be 900 and 1,000 in December, there was no way we were going to be able to do that. It was just in the community. And this is what we were looking at early on. This is what, what gave us a lot of pause. Okay, we were looking at numbers going up and no sign of when they were going down. We were trying to figure out the doubling time. This is exponential. It's doubling. It's not just increasing by a constant rate. It's doubling. When was it going to stop doubling? We asked the hospitals, and hospitals are notorious for taking a long time to do things. They figured out a surge plan in 13 days. They figured out a way to triple our hospital bed capacity in this county in 13 days. Okay? That's how hard the hospital worked those 13 days, and a lot of people, not just hospitals. We were looking at all sorts of curves, you know, flatten the curve, trying to make a model. Okay, we didn't have any help from the federal government on this one. Zero. Silence from the CDC. State Health Department wasn't all that helpful either. Um, because one of the criticisms, and it's a still a criticism, it'll be a chapter in my book, the State Health Department did nothing from a leadership standpoint to guide us through the pandemic at a local level. You know, we were looking to the CDC and frankly one another. So my county health commissioners were on speed dial with each other all the time. And even today, we're exchanging messages about test to stay, which is something we'll talk about in our press briefing today. But we were trying to figure out what was this curve. And so we had a curve. This was the curve that we had in our mind, using the best available data for what things would look like for hospitalizations, ICU patients, and people on a ventilator. Okay? We thought it was going to peak on May 18th. We thought that on May 15th, we would have to deploy a field hospital at the Rochester Convention Center. We had a plan in place that would cost $15 million. Okay, we were going to staff it with the National Guard. It was going to be similar to the Javits Center that was in New York City. And thankfully, what happened was this. That was the curve that happened in Monroe County. So we never needed that plan. Thankfully, we didn't have to spend that $15 million on a field hospital. But we didn't know until May 1st. We were all systems go in April to have a field hospital. And we didn't uh, do it, and we, it ended up being the right call. Uh, not that money can replace people, but if you can avoid wasting $15 million, that's a good thing. And this is what happened in nursing homes. Um, and one of the challenges that Michael Lewis talks about in the book is that there are very disjointed levels of command. And nursing homes uh, is a great example, probably the worst example of that in in the, in the state, for sure. So what do I mean by that? Nursing homes and hospitals are in the same bucket in that they are diagnostic and treatment centers under public health law. So they report to the state health department. You'll recall, I criticized the state health department about a minute ago for not providing leadership. 
They did not lead us in nursing homes. I'm sitting here at the local health department. I have no formal role in nursing homes. I can say hi, shake hands, but I can't do anything in a nursing home, even under a state of emergency, because that's not our law. It's a state law. So it's the state's state of emergency that could have allowed me to work in nursing homes like I had wanted to, because I saw that that was the most vulnerable place. I remember saying very early, the what's going to bite us in the you-know-what is when you have staff working in multiple nursing homes. And I was right. That's exactly how it spread in nursing homes. Because nursing home patients aren't generally going anywhere. And they didn't have visitors at the time. So how did all of these nursing homes catch COVID? It's the staff. And when you have one person working at three nursing homes, because he or she needs three jobs to make their ends meet, and by the way, these are uh, you know, individuals who make less than minimum wage at the time, that is how the entire nursing home fabric raveled, unraveled here in New York State. And I, I sat there, I, we convened a team of people to do what we could, but at the end of the day, we needed the state to step up, and they didn't step up. And so the nursing home tragedy is, I, I think, unfortunately, one of the worst tragedies that we'll have to endure uh, in COVID, at least in this country. So, mortality in nursing homes, mortality in COVID as of last September, three quarters of it is among nursing home residents and long-term care residents. And obviously, death isn't the only thing we want to prevent, but that's certainly up there. So, 10 minutes left. What am I going to talk about? Let's go to where we are today. Because I think this is important. How many of you have seen the movie Hunger Games? Or read the book Hunger Games? One of the lines in Hunger Games is, let's not forget who the real enemy is. And I think in the discourse that we've engaged in in the last 18 months, we've forgotten who the real enemy is. Um, this has been politicized and polarized like nothing else in our history. And that is the enemy right there. That is who we should be rallying against and fighting against. And unfortunately, our conversation and rhetoric have us fighting with one another, and that is a shame. Hospitalizations right now are on the rise. ICU beds are filling up again. Like I said earlier, our numbers are going up, sadly. I'm looking for the silver lining, but when you see two days in the 300s, two days in a row in the 300s, it's hard to be optimistic right now. The whole country is right now in a high transmission zone. This doesn't make the media anymore because this is old news. People are getting complacent. I'm, I'm fed up with COVID. I'll say that right now. But I can't, I don't have the luxury of just walking away and throwing my hands up. We've got to keep working at it. And that's how the rest of the public needs to think about this. But we don't. Because we have short attention spans in the media, and therefore people have a short attention span as well. But the country is still on fire when it comes to COVID. We're not done with this. Okay, numbers are going down in some places, but we're not done with this until we're all done with this. And when we think of, about all, we should be thinking about the globe. Because even if we can make it endemic, and that's what it's going to be when it's done here in the United States, um, as long as we have travel to other countries that are not where we are, COVID will remain a threat to some degree. Um, this is how we are with um, cases of vaccine-eligible people. These are 12 and older. These are total cases. When you adjust it by population, it's a little bit different. Okay. But what I'll share with you is that this isn't a perfect match to the vaccine rate in the county, okay? When you look at the vaccination rates, the east side is much more highly vaccinated than the west side is for a lot of reasons. Um, it's not just political, okay? That's an easy first thing. But when you really dig into the data, it's education and um, income level. Those are the two strongest predictors of getting your vaccine. Now, political affiliation is highly tied to uh, education level and uh, socioeconomic status, but by itself, I mean, some of our most conservative areas in this, in this county are the most highly vaccinated. So Pittsburgh has a high Republican rate for what it is, but they're highly educated and there isn't much poverty in Pittsburgh, and that's why they're highly vaccinated. It's not because they're Democrats. So um, we have a long way to go in the vaccine game. This whole graph is gonna change tomorrow because five to 11 year olds will be eligible to get their vaccine very soon. 
Uh, and so here we go again. I do think, though, that once we get beyond 5 to 11, once we have more 5 to 11-year-olds vaccinated, we'll start talking about what happens after the pandemic. Okay, what happens after the pandemic is that COVID will become endemic, meaning it's just going to be one of those things that we deal with all the time, uh, much like the common colds, which mutate all the time. Okay? Right now, COVID is killing a lot of people. Over 1,400 people in Monroe County, over 700,000 in the uh, United States. On a global level, we're not doing so well, okay? And when you look at how many resources we could have poured into this, we are not doing very well as a country, unfortunately. Um, here in Monroe County, our doubling rate right now is about eight weeks, which is good. The rest of the region's doubling rate is one to two weeks, which is not good, okay? So we are on the brink. Uh, if we uh, don't get our surrounding counties more highly vaccinated, we're sitting, sitting ducks here again in Monroe County. Um, this is the vaccine rate by school district for vaccine eligible school students. Uh, I'm ashamed to see that Brighton has fallen to fourth place. We were second place for a long time. But we were just recently surpassed by Rush Henrietta and Fairport. And honestly, that's not the point. Okay, the point is that we got to look at the bottom. Okay, East Rochester uh, the City, Wheatland Chi Lane, they've been consistently below 60%, um, and that's reducing a lot of cases. And no, it's, it's not that kids don't get this. Kids do get this. Kids get very sick from this. Okay, you know, we used to say, oh, the kids should get vaccinated because they can protect grandma. Well, that's true. We also want to protect the kids. Um, and I think that's a part of the narrative that we've got to adjust. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to close with something that the book talks a lot about, which is hate. Inadvertently hate. Hate against science, hate against public health officials who represent science. Um, for the better part of this pandemic, I've had the Brighton police outside my house. Uh, my office has gotten death threats. I've gotten death threats. Uh, it did not have to be this way. Uh, it's hard to not think that that is how most people are. But the reality is that most people are not that way. But when you get threats against your family and yourself and your house, it's really hard. And when you look across the state, Nine of the leading state health officials left their job last year. I think a third of my counterparts across the uh, state have resigned or have been asked to step down. Um, in the largest counties, we've all, we've all hung in there, but it's not fun some days. Um, none of us signed up for this. None of us wanted this. None of us, none of us needed to have this. And it's, a, it's a, an unfortunate statement an indictment on where we are in terms of the conversation around health and science in our country. Uh, it did not have to be this way. So with that, I will close and take any questions. I will close and take any questions. All right. I don't know how much time we have left. How many questions do you want to take? Um, oh. whatever. <laughs> All right. Please work. I have two questions. Um, what do you see? Do you see any improvements in possible um, being more careful and being more prepared for it? the next thing? I mean, if, if this goes away, do you think that we will put something in place? The science is easy. There are too many scientists, scientists who know what to do, and you know we, this isn't hard. But we need the political will to help. Okay, um, politicians don't look in more than four or six year horizons for obvious reasons. Um, you know, one of my mentors said to me, you know, your job is not to know when you're ready to leave a job, it's, it's when you're halfway done with the job. Because when you're not yet halfway done with the job, you should be looking at how do you make your job better. I don't believe I'm at the halfway point in my job. I've been in my role six years, I want to stay at least 12. So um, I say all that to say that my horizon is longer and I don't care about who gets elected for me. Um, things were very different with Cheryl Donolfo than they are with Adam Donolfo, or Adam Bello. Um, but I have to find a way to do it from the perspective of science and medicine. Uh, I do think things will get better if the political will is there. The scientific recommendations are the easy part. I can write that down now. Okay. Now, if you could throw money at one part of your budget, what part would it be? Outreach. 
I would want more outreach in the community. I would want more of a public health presence in libraries and pharmacies, schools. I meet with uh, the school counselors, mental health counselors, and they all say to me, you know, well, I ask them, what, what do you need from the health department? And they say they want, they want the ability to communicate, both receive and transmit communications to um, schools and to healthcare. Sorry, public health uh, entities and primary care offices. Schools want to communicate with them about when they have a kid who is expressing thoughts of harm. They have nowhere to go because laws prevent them from reaching out. And, and they want a way, and even if laws didn't, we don't have a fabric of people ready to pick up the call. And we ought to do better than that. So I'll reach. Two, two questions. The first, I know a lot of parents locally were upset that they saw schools opening in other counties around the state when they weren't opening here. And I'm just wondering why the discrepancy? Why, why were things opening up in other places now? Opening up in what way? Because uh, there, there are groups of parents, um, uh, Christina Higley, I think, was on a broadcast talking about yeah. this, that they were trying to get answers from school boards and as to why we were not opening up here, but they were looking at other counties in the states where things were even fully open at that time that she did the interview. You know, every county is different. And um, we were open, a lot of schools were open last year. Um, we had remote for most of the schools, but when you look at other uh, schools that have the space, but what made it so that we couldn't fully open last year was six feet. So when you look out to Walworth, they don't have a six feet problem there because they don't have a lot of people and they have large buildings. So you could open a school uh, in that way fully. But you know, I said to the student, you know, there isn't a single district in public school district in the county that had the ability of having six feet of distance between every kid. And given the science at the time, we said six feet matters. And my, my second question, I, I read an article about this, and it, it doesn't seem to be uh, two sides to this, it's not well covered, but that the, the broadcaster Shannon Joy was met at her house by two policemen and two contact tracers, and what I have heard is that she's the only person this has ever happened to. Do the police regularly get, um, go with contact tracers to people's homes to deliver porn? No, we, this is a rare event, she's not the only one, but, but uh, the isolation order is binding. It's public health law, that's enforceable. Uh, we don't want to go that right route because my role as is, is a health department is in general not to enforce anything. We want to prevent and educate. And we only enforce when we have to. But uh, when we get inclinations, when somebody says, I'm going to Whiteman's now, I didn't say that's not what she said, I'm making that up. But if somebody says that they're you know, blatantly going to defy their isolation order, we have an obligation to public health to not just sit and watch. And did the police regularly attend? Um, no. No, no. We've isolated, I mean, hundreds of thousands of individuals, probably under a dozen. Is she the single person that happened to, or have the police you know, brought in other people's out? We've had others. Yeah. I was just wondering, at the beginning of the pandemic, we got numbers every day of how many cases there were in the area, and I find that that's not happening like it was, and I was wondering why. And then the second question is, So to your first question about data reporting, you know, we can report data until we're blue in the face, but I believe that our responsibility is to report data that are accurate and informative. And early in the pandemic, you know, we thought that that would be helpful. And um, now it doesn't seem to correlate. You know, when, when you, even when you have a total number, um, there's no guarantee that that's the total number. There are a lot of people who aren't even testing. There are a lot of people who are testing at home and not telling anybody. And you know, it's really hard to know who those people are. Um, but 337 is the minimum. And when we were looking at it from a per capita basis on the basis of zip code, um, what ended up happening is when you look at a certain zip code, if there's a nursing home there, it looks like things are on fire. But the reality is that there's a nursing home there and the rest of the community is actually doing better than the zip code next door that doesn't have a nursing home. So that's why we stopped doing that because there were a lot of uh, clusters that would misrepresent the rate in a particular jurisdiction. And then there's privacy, like I can't report the data based on your street address because that's a violation of privacy. So there, there wasn't really a good medium, a good way to, to report that. Concerns about the inner city. Our concerns about the inner city. What are the plans to 
to help the inner city is like their numbers are terrible. So the the numbers of vaccinations in the city is generally lag behind. It's true, and it's not surprising. You know, a lot of indicators lag behind in the city. You know, we enjoy in general the access to to transportation and you know information uh, outside of the city that is not present unilaterally you know, in the city. So for everything we've done in the county, we've done probably two or threefold more in the city, and our numbers still don't show it because it's that hard. Um, but we are we are having vaccination settings that are, you know, in any given month, let's say we have 18 vaccine clinics, 14, 13 of them are in the city. So it's just a hard problem. So when this first started back, you know, before March, um, I remember thinking this was going to be a big problem in the developing countries. Mm -hmm. And it's not as nearly as much in most of them, but it is here. What are your thoughts on that? So depending on which developing country you look at, you know, India is not a developing country in most cases, but they are highly densely populated. So one of the features of some developing countries is that they're very densely populated, and when they're very densely populated, it makes it really easy for communicable illness to transmit. But when you look at most of the developing world, a couple things pop out. One is um, a less dense population. People don't interact in the same ways. They're outdoors more. Move that as a bike circulation desk, please move that in. Am I hearing voices? <laughs> um, and then there's political will. Okay, and in China or in Southeast Asia, when the government says wear your masks, people don't flip out about it. They just put their mask on. And they've done better in general. Um, you know, vaccine. Ma I wish we didn't have to mandate vaccines. I wish people would just look at the signs and say, it's a smart thing to do. Okay, people don't question wearing seatbelts now. They're mandated, but you don't put your seatbelt on when you get in the car because it's mandatory. You do it because it's a good idea. And that's where we ought to be with vaccines. Um, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of people say, well, people who aren't vaccinated don't listen to science. That's not true. They listen to science, it's just the wrong science. There are, there are doctors and scientists out there now who will substantiate just about any claim that you can think of. And it takes a specialist to look at science in a, in a sophisticated way. You know, I've done research in critical appraisal of medical literature. That's a field in medicine. And now we've got people on Facebook who think they're experts at looking at science. And it's unfortunate because they're misinforming a lot of people. Um, but we, don't, we, we shouldn't need to mandate something that is now proven to work. I wanted to say one thing. My son lives in China and he ha I asked him how many people he knew who had COVID in China, and it's zero. He knows nobody because they really do clamp down on things. The other question I, or question I had was, I am fully vaccinated, I had my booster, I'm old. Um, what, what kinds of precautions should I be doing now? Right now, you know, I still wear a mask when I go into any place. Uh, I've eaten in a restaurant outside. What kind of precautions should I be doing right now? So risk is a very personal thing. Um, and I'm not about to tell anybody how to set their level of risk aversion, you know, because that's a personal choice. You know, you have to weigh, you know, the benefits of something with the risks of something. This is a communicable illness. So if you're in a room with nobody else, you're not gonna catch COVID. And that's not the way to live. So we've gotta find the right balance. So, you know, it's, it's like, um, you know, we can't tell people don't smoke. We do, but it doesn't always work. There are people who smoke. And we say, well, if you smoke, can you maybe cut back a little bit, okay? You're not eliminating risk altogether, but you're decreasing it. So it's really an issue of how do you wanna decrease risk and at what cost? So, you know, for people who are generally older, and this is what the data shows, they are much more risk averse. They don't want to take chances in general with their, their health. So they will try to limit their interactions to people who are vaccinated. Um, that's more important than wearing a mask, okay? Because we know that people who 
get COVID who are vaccinated are far, far less likely to be hospitalized or succumb to COVID. Doesn't mean they won't get it, okay? But that doesn't mean that the vaccine's not working. It just means it's not perfect, and nobody said it was gonna be perfect. Um, but if you limit the number of interactions, if they're all vaccinated, if you're wearing your mask, you know, outdoors is getting hard these days. Um, but that's, you know, that's as much as anybody can tell you to do. You know, but there is something to be said for social interaction and seeing your loved ones and enjoying life because nobody knows how many more days we have on this, on this earth. So we all have to make that decision on a, on a personal level. All right, let's do one last, all right, two last questions. Let's see here. Yeah, I'm going to do this. Oh, I'm going to do this gentleman, and then I'll do you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, how good are the numbers? I know John Hopkins is uh, the gold standard, uh, and what is it? Five. We're at five million worldwide, seven fifty in the United States. Is there a lot of underreporting? Is is do the John Hopkins numbers take into account underreporting? Either to you know the system isn't good or. There's no perfect system, and Johns Hopkins isn't really the gold standard, okay? They're well known, they know what they're doing, but they're making a lot of assumptions on data collection that are, that could be wrong. You know, I look at them as highly, highly valid, um, but they're not perfect. You know, underreporting is happening everywhere, and, you know, you could measure the degree of underreporting in a community. The problem is that the degree of underreporting is also variable, okay? In some parts of the country, the underreporting rate is 20%, in some parts it's 70%. So it's really hard. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm beginning to evolve a little bit on, on how we look at this pandemic because 325 cases today is different than 325 cases a year ago. A year ago, we didn't have a vaccine. Now, we've got a vaccine, a highly effective vaccine. Uh, of the 337 today, I, I don't know, probably 23% of them are vaccinated. Okay? They're not the ones who even go to the hospital though. Okay, so the remaining 87% or 77% are the people we have to worry about. Whereas last year we worried about all of them because we didn't know who was going to end up in the hospital. So the number, I'm beginning to wonder whether we think about reporting differently every day uh, because the total number doesn't tell the whole story. Okay, you, you just answered my question. Good, you get another one. Ask another one. Okay. There will always be variants. There are variants. So influenza has a new variant every year. Okay? It's it's endemic. We know this. We get boosters every year for influenza. That's what it is. Every year's flu shot is a booster shot. Um, I don't know if we're gonna have annual boosters for COVID yet. Um, but this is a race between the vaccine and the variants. If we can out vaccinate the variants then we're done. But there are always variants because there are always going to be people, unfortunately, who are not vaccinated. And those are the people who are breeding the more uh, significant variants. India is who spawned the Delta variant, unfortunately, because they were under vaccinated at the time and there's a lot of people in India. Uh, right now, we don't have very large parts of the, the world that are very populated that are that low in vaccine rate now. So we will have variants, but I don't think we're going to see one nearly the, the size or strength of Delta. Thank you so much, Dr. Really appreciate it.